Okay, here we are. I guess well, Matt, we're uh, we're live. The Fantastic. Start. The start. The start exactly. of the twenty-four hour podcast in aid of Rocking Horse. Um I'm in what I'd class now as this is probably my, known as my happy place now. I've spent most of my life in here, which I absolutely love. So, um, and look, couldn't be better than to be welcomed by um, my first guest and obviously sponsors for today and, you know, uh, joint CEO and co-founder, Matt Hunter of the amazing Plus X. And here we are in the Plus X studio doing it all. Well, thank you, Sam. It's, it's, it's an absolute honour to be here. Complete delight that you're using this place for such an impressive bit of work you know 24 <laughs> hours um uh so yeah c couldn't be happier amazing well look, uh, we're gonna um we're gonna kick off with the first episode we're gonna delve straight in mate just tell listeners a little bit about yourself about your business journey and your story yeah well maybe i should explain a little bit about sort of where i am now yeah. and then i'll say a little bit about how i got here over the it's getting on for 30 years so yeah. so it's quite a winding path but look here we are in uh plus x in brighton right and plus x is a network of innovation hubs. And innovation hubs for us are the places where innovators and entrepreneurs or just, you know, modern ambitious business leaders want to put their business. Um, and it's pretty straightforward in some ways. It's, you know, create a great building, which brings together a great community of people, give them some additional really specialist facilities like physical maker spaces with laser cutters and all the rest of it, VR suites, and guess what? A podcast studio. Um, because that's how you get work done, right? You know, you really want to, to maximize your productivity, but then also some fantastic advice from, you know, experts, academics, whatever else, you know, everything you need, like a one-stop shop for, for building a business. And, and our main point is we want to make 25 of these across the UK because we just don't have enough support, especially outside of central London. Central London's probably got quite a lot of support yep. for innovators and entrepreneurs, but what about everywhere else? So, you know, Brighton's been a fantastic place for us to build our first kind of full-size hub. Yes. And it is, uh, look, I, I, I'm here, like I say, use the, use the amazing facilities with a podcast studio, but also I was part of the Bright program and we launched County Business Clubs, which again, a great level of support over that six month and makes you accountable for where you are with your business. And that, yeah. that certainly that's, you know, I've run businesses for nearly 15 years now, but that starting point, you need that bit of help, that little bit of guidance stuff that maybe you don't know about. And yeah, I, I, I think that's absolutely the case. And so the starting position absolutely is, you know, I'm running a small business. Maybe, maybe this is the first time I'm doing it, or maybe I'm experienced, but I'm trying something new, yeah. you know, not only is there a hell of a lot to know and learn, and so therefore there's a kind of knowledge sort of acquisition need. You've got to get, got to grab all this knowledge, but also psychologically, it's stressful. It's intimidating. It's all of these things, and so I think for us, it, it is psychological as much as it's practical. And then more than that, I think you know, really, I would say, 21st century everyone know, knows they have to innovate. I, I, I could be leading a government department or a big corporate or whatever else, right? And so for us, it's not only about the smaller businesses, the newer businesses, it's actually making sure the bigger businesses get involved. And of course, actually, huge part of the success of this place was to do with the local authority, the local government, the way they said, we need this in our, in our city. Um, let's do all we can to make it happen. So they were instrumental as well. And then obviously collaboration with the university. So like for us, it's, it's, it's about everyone. Maybe we'll come into this in some ways. Yeah, it, it's yeah, about yeah. bringing all of these things together. And, and funnily enough, over the past, I think literally month when I've been chatting to people about this and maybe I, people I knew across my career, yeah. sometimes they said to me, oh, that's like what you were doing there or look what you're doing here. And I, I really feel for me, and of course, this has been with my, co-founder and, and co-chief executive Paul Rustus, who brings a really fa fabulous complementary perspective to, 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 to how we do Plus X. But for me, uh, I suppose I'm really excited because it's almost like using everything I've ever learned yeah, sure. uh, to make this work. Uh, so uh, that, that, that's you're what- You're very yeah. much like from design background and yeah, well, that sort of space and innovation. That, this is it. I, I started um, first as a, an industrial designer. So that's like design for manufacture. We almost do, don't do that much in this country yeah. anymore, um, which is possibly why I slightly retrained yeah. at the Royal College of Art to become a digital designer. And what was happening in the um, early 90s was that all of the, this design skill that had been used for making manufactured goods, all the consumer goods that we sort of experienced in the 20th, 20th century, everyone went, oh God, we need that for software as well, or these digital things we, we're using. So of course, so I got my first job in Silicon Valley. I got an internship, age 24 in Silicon Valley. And then I phoned them up after I finished my degree. And I said, you got a job and they said, yes. So I was phenomenally lucky 
in yeah. being able to land in Silicon Valley in the place of innovation. So absolutely, I'm trained as a designer. What's but that, it's, what's that? It, so just quickly then, what's that, that experience there, like being in Silicon Valley, how, how, is, how is that? As a... Well, I mean, to some extent, you could argue, I hadn't got a clue how lucky I was, <laughs> yeah. right? It was like normal. You kind of go, well, of course I'm going to Silicon Valley, you know. That's and what I want to get into. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that was the amazing thing. In other words, I never had an ambition to go to Silicon oh, wow. Valley. It's just the particular program I was on at the Royal College of Art around this computer design. Um, it was such an early thing for designers to be involved in the design of software rather than the, code, the coding of it, the engineering that we would we would go to an annual conference called the computer human interaction conference and it was in boston in 1994 or 93. um so so and it was a very american-led thing so yeah. so i went okay yeah it's a school trip you know let, let's get let's go out to, to boston so so i think that's the thing for me i never had an ambition to be there so it wasn't like i i'd been grasping for it and reaching for it i was just phenomenally lucky to land there and of course I just really enjoyed it. I mean, there were some great people, some great projects. I was working for some fantastic corporates or, 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 or startups, you know, um, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, what a way to start. I, I mean, I can't say much more than that, really. Absolutely. I mean, I'm keen, obviously, with, with Plus X, obviously, in Brighton opened in sort of July 2020, so <laughs> banged you in a global pandemic. Yeah. Talk, talk to me about that experience, like <laughs> co-working space in... Well, I mean, on the one hand, it's funny looking back at that time of lockdowns, you know, March 23rd, 2020, whatever it was. And somehow, I suppose, you know, the whole thing was a remarkable example of how adaptable humans can be and organizations can be. Look, on a really practical level, we were lucky because we, we had a team probably about 20 by then. I'm not entirely sure how big we were, but we all had laptops. We all had the kind of the, the, the sort of the right software so we could work remotely so actually that move to working remotely working from home or whatever that was pretty straightforward and and, and as you say the this building wasn't open but we had our west london hub yeah, yeah, yeah. so the first thing we did march 23rd was close our, our west london hub because we had to sort of take stock right yeah, yeah, you know yeah, yeah. it was locked down work from home but actually we had such a massive uh, negative reaction from our members because our west london hub is is even more than here focused on physical manufacture yeah. and um, so people were making physical things. You can't do that from home. We do have the big equipment, the laser cutters, the milling machines, all the rest of it. And so it took us two weeks in order to speak to our insurers, really go through the health and safety yeah, stuff yeah. and work out, could we open in a safe way? And we opened and, and everyone thanked us for it. And they started making personal protective equipment for the NHS. Right. So using the laser cutters, using the 3D printers to make the kind of the masks and all of yeah. those things that were in short supply, if you remember. So in other words, so this was sort of late March, let's yeah. say. So we'd begun to work out how to operate our existing hub yeah. so that when finally we got the keys to this place and, and sort of, you know, a plan to open in June, yeah. we were like, firstly, we believe we can operate these things in a safe way. Yeah. And, and we believe authentically we can ask business owners, can you work from home or do you need not to work from home? Yeah. And secondly, we knew that our communities were saying, actually, it can be really tough for me to work from home. And of course, as I'm saying, part of it was to do with physical making, but actually here, it's a much more mixed community. It isn't all about physical making. So then that was much more about the psychology. Then it was like, yeah, but my business is tanking. What am I going to do? And actually what we began to do was collect this community together and people realized they would really be helping each other out. As I said earlier on, psychologically as much as practically. So we just, we grew month on month. And now, you know, we're 90% full of our, our, our main flex office space so we kind of really hit our our targets for filling up a community and for me and anyone of course who builds a, a business yeah. in, in a recession or yeah. a crisis or whatever says i'm so delighted to prove that we can you know our proposition is so strong yeah. we can punch through the bad times yeah. because we all know hopefully we can survive in the good times but the real question is whether or not you are relevant and meaningful even when things are difficult and obviously now when we're heading into potentially an economic recession yeah. we're equally asking ourselves the question what is it that we do to help all of these businesses especially the smaller businesses yeah. to fight and survive and thrive even in the face now of a a recession rather than the you know the covid lockdown I th what i really take from that and certainly something i, I guess i've definitely embraced run, running my own businesses for for many years uh 
you know, last 10 years I've worked from home, never had an office space and because I was always out and about. Um, actually, when COVID happened and lockdown, etc., you, you did like, you wanted to reach out. You, and a community was something for me that really become even more relevant so, and such a, we've got such an amazing community within Sussex, Brighton, especially, but in Sussex in general. And and I couldn't run up, obviously one of the reasons I, I've got a space here was because of the podcast shoot, which is amazing, but just to be part of a community within some, and you could reach out and say people are friendly, you build relationships, you bounce ideas off people. If you're struggling, you can openly talk. And I think certainly what, you, what you've created here one, it's an amazing space. Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah. fantastic like architecture. architecture. Yeah. Yeah. Phenomenal. Um, so, and raise the bar when it comes, I guess, to co-working spaces in that level. But ultimately, still the core being that we've created a community here and and, and support. Yeah, and and what I would say is, especially in the world of real estate, the word community is used a hell of a lot. Mm. But how you actually make that is phenomenally difficult. And in many ways, that's what we pride ourselves on at Plus X is that we aren't from a classic real estate background. We don't just think about the building. Yeah. We, we sort of think about the building because we want to create the community. Our mission is to create you know, amazing entrepreneurial, innovative communities. That's our mission rather than building lots of buildings. It happens to be for multiple reasons that the act of creating a physical building makes this Thing work because we believe fundamentally in that bumping into people, the casual chat, the water cooler stuff that still is alive and well in the 21st century post, post pandemic, right? But also actually it's even from an economic sustainability point of view, because let's face it, as you're doing, we're build, building a business. And so a very purposeful business, but you've got to build something that, that economically can survive, right? And, 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 and to scale. And ultimately that, in, that is all about saying the base level is people need space. Yeah. They're willing to pay for space, yeah. but all of the stuff we, all the value we layer on top of it yeah. is what makes it more than just space. And as you say, so our real job is to make a community, but we're using physical space as a sort of an engine yeah. of that community creation and thereby actually, you know, the, the, the outcome in many ways is economic growth, jobs, better wages, all that kind of stuff, which is the, is, is, you know, the more meta level idea of, yeah. of what we do for cities. You know? It's amazing. What, again, taking from that, uh, we've done a lot of work. A lot of people know about Simon Sinek and the Golden Circle, and it, we've done a lot of work with the guys. At Inside Stories are fascinating. I'll like, just get into the core of what County Business Club is about and that, how, what, why. And just listening to you talk is amazing, actually. Your why, we're creating, yeah. creating communities. We happen to build spaces that are brilliant for people to excel, and then that's going to lead to, like, you just listen. I could, how you describe that as well in that way just your how what why in, in that format yeah amazing. if i was using my design training um one of the big things about design how, how it's evolved and i think i'm um, become more powerful over the past few, few decades um often uh, people use the phrase design thinking which is sort of how designers work and of course it's something we helped to pioneer at ideo that the company yeah. where, where i was for 15 years the point for me is, is about saying, understand properly the problem that you're trying to solve. And indeed, what you need to do is fall in love with the problem, not the solution, right? And that for me is very close to Simon Sinek, start with why, right? So for me, the most powerful thing as a designer is always to understand what are you trying to improve for someone, for, for multiple people? And it's by falling in love with the problem that you keep on trying different solutions. And some solutions are right, some are wrong, uh, some will sustain, some will need to be replaced, but your const the constant is, is, is the problem or, and, and, and the beneficiary, the impact you want to have in the world and the solution are all, you know, these are all these different solutions around the edge. And so, yeah, I'm a big fan of, you know, start with why, but I think that's how I tie it back to my design perspective. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I think, and, and, and any, any business and entrepreneur you speak to, um, you know, I do different groups and we sit around and, and even on the podcast and, when I talk about it and stuff is ultimately what problem are you trying to solve? Like as a business, if you're starting out, you yeah. speak to someone, I've got this idea, but what problem are you trying to solve? And yeah. when they take it back to that, oh, actually, well, I'm just doing this the same as that, but you're not so what problem are you? And then once you get to the core of that, that's where things grow. And you it, it's such an anchor. And, and of course, another thing that, that we, because we do do it so much, you know, working with, with different businesses, there's another sort of uh, classic phrase, which is used these days, which I also like, I think it's really valuable, which is, are you, making painkillers or vitamins. So 
what problem are you solving? Sometimes vitamins are, feel, are, are seen as things that are nice, but not necessarily something that everyone really needs. Yeah. Whereas painkillers are things, almost back to my point of how do you find something that will endure through different economic cycles? Yeah. You know, what's an enduring need that people have? Trying to find those painkillers, those real pain points that you can create a painkiller for, rather than just a vitamin, a nice to have, not a must have. Yeah. Those are some of the nuances of of, of, of how we coach people exactly yeah, yeah. to say, what problem are you solving? How do you know it's a problem? Is it a real problem? Is it an enduring problem? Is it a real massive pain? Yeah. Uh, I know it's a bit sort of dark and dystopian in some yeah. ways, but the bigger the pain, the, the, the more good you're going to be doing in the absolutely. world if you can fix it. You know? oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think I'm, look, I'm keen to just still touch on the, the, the community side of things. Like I said, it's something I'm really passionate about. And, and like I said, what you've created is amazing. I'm, I always talk on podcasts about culture. Um, so you're obviously creating a culture with your members, etc. But talk to me as well about the, the culture you're creating within Plus X from the staff and how that sort of feels down. Talk to me a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think one of the things is that, um, you know, we, we as a team, actually, uh, as a Plus X team, we have kind of six organisational values. And I, I won't take you through all, all of them, but a lot of them are about having a real purpose. Um, also, though, being very empowering and empowered and learning that whole idea, I guess, within a startup of just adapting and learning the whole time. But another one of them is really important is having a business mindset. And of course, one of those classic challenges is how do you create purpose in the world and find that under, under, underlying economic sustainable engine that allows you to, to scale up that impact and that purpose? So I think that um, and I think there's another aspect to it, which is around inclusion how do you have such richness and diversity of, of perspectives i mean again I, I was really lucky because the place where i started i could be working in healthcare one moment um or, uh, you know issues of actually I was working for the home office on security when i was at the design council yeah. there um working on on young young people and, and them getting jobs i could be doing uh, consumer entertainment i mean i've been so lucky to work in very very diverse sectors yeah. and what it proved to me as I said earlier, is that everyone's got to innovate. Now, one of the challenges is that so often people think that innovation or business is a very sort of narrow concept. So one of the things for Plus X is how do we encourage a really diverse group of, of people in here? Mm -hmm. And for me, that's really important. So one of the things when, whenever we were talking as a team about, well, who comes into the building and do we sort of interview them? You know, I was, I, we were doing some research in, in, in Dublin a few years ago. And we sort of said, can we come and see this innovation hub? And we're slightly in stealth mode. So we're slightly pretending not to be potentially competitive. <laughs> and they said, well, um, are you from a startup? So we sort of said, well, yes, we are from a startup. And they were interviewing us to, to essentially say, were we worthy of walking through the doors? And I suppose one of the things that we would discuss as a team here, and I suppose I, I tried to champion, was to say for me, no, I don't care whether you're a lawyer or an AI coder or an accountant or a movie producer or anything like that. Yeah. The question I want to ask you is, do you want to make something amazing and new? Do you, and do you need to collaborate? So for me, it was merely, what is your attitude yeah. towards collaborative innovation? I don't care what your background yeah. is. So it's, I would call it attitudinal segmentation because yeah. otherwise people sort of think, oh, well, we'll definitely get a, a software team in here. Bunch of lawyers, less so, but actually, um, if we got a bunch of software coders that frankly were going to shut the door and not talk to anyone, yeah. um, maybe there was a bunch of human rights lawyers who wanted to create a whole new uh, chatbot app for immigrants to better access um, uh, the, 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 the human rights law, which has been a, a fantastic innovation that I've read about in the past. You know, I'd, write, I'd like the lawyers, please, you know, yeah, yeah, because yeah. maybe they'd be collaborating in the building. So for me, this is so part of the community is all about saying again, what is our common, common purpose? Yeah. So we talk about wanting ambitious businesses to come in. So we certainly say nothing about who you are or what your background is, or, yeah. or to some extent what you're trying to do. It's more like, what do you want to get out of it? Yeah. And so for us, therefore, if you are ambitious and hopefully purposeful and want to collaborate, well, this is the place to be. Yeah. So that, that for me has always been the point. Yeah, wear your values on your sleeve, yeah. tell the stories and celebrate the collaborations and the positivity and the inclusion and people will naturally be drawn to you yeah. um so yeah that's the way i think about it it is the, it is this positive collaborative spirit really and that again for me something certainly i think 
you know was heightened and come out of lockdown massively and 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 the whole pandemic was was collaboration how many people actually prior to prior to lockdown you look at collaboration it become a real buzzword i guess d- during that period but it was that actually because we were all in a really unknown tough space yeah. and actually i needed to reach out to people in the same sector as me and like, you know how are you dealing with this let's can we support each other how can we work together on that basis and what an amazing thing it created because and i'd like to think that we have there's been a shift in that way that people have changed their mindset around it's not about that very you know use quite a lot the hashtag you know collaborate collaboration over competition which i think is such a powerful message and i'm i've always been about that i'm a, again I'm, my passion is about community and, and working with people and supporting people and it's not about then oh well this is my sector and i'm gonna take that and, and yeah. concentrate on that you know yeah i i think it's it's sort of by understanding how huge the world is in terms of possibility yeah, yeah. but also understanding how big and complex so many of the problems are that we face yeah. And what I've always said is that you will know that you need to collaborate and partner with other people. If you're trying to achieve something, you know, you cannot achieve by yourself. And frankly, anyone that's trying to achieve anything of note, I think should be going, how the hell am I going to do that? Right. (laughs) Um, And, and, and you understand that better than anyone else, how you, again, are just pulling these people together. And hopefully um, what you're doing is you're helping them to elevate their ambition, to be even more ambitious, perhaps because they, um, are, are buoyed up by other people yeah. um, and, and, and increasing their confidence. But then there's kind of, oh, wow, uh, I've agreed to do that. Uh, right now, I, now you need to help me to do that. Yeah. So, so I do feel this is sort of a ratcheting thing where, where, where we should all be making bigger ambitions. Um, and, then, and then we have to collaborate to make that happen. I mean, just for me as an example, I think if, if I was running Plus X by myself, um, we wouldn't be aiming for the scale that we do because Paul as a co-founder is just wonderful in his sort of energy and ambition yeah, yeah. going right 25 in five years come on let's do it you know so again we I think we complement each other very well but it, you know it's not just his his finance knowledge and his real estate knowledge but his kind of his his exactly. ambition yeah. um which helps me then to go yeah right let's do this right how are we gonna do it so I, I love that idea I think of of, of both collaboration being about the goal setting as much as the achieving of those goals you yeah. know i love that i love that i want to i want to talk because obviously you mentioned about the community meant about some of the great innovators that you know you sort of worked with and certainly people that are, are here T- tell me is there since obviously plus x obviously with the other side and especially in brighton any any particular companies that have really stood out for you yeah I'm, I'm gonna start by answering that in a really annoying way saying i'm sorry i'm not gonna pick on one right it's yeah, that classic yeah, point yeah. of uh, I can't pick, uh, you know, a favorite child, right? Yeah, yeah. But it is really serious that I am impressed by every single business and every single founder. And that's what I love is that you can speak to every single person and learn something. You can, every member of my, of our team at Plus X, you know, speak to and go, wow, you know, I've learned something from you. So I suppose I'm a, I love learning. And for me, each different person that I speak to, um, I learn something from. Secondly, I've already spoken about diversity. Yes, I started in Silicon Valley doing digital things, but I love the fact that, you know, here in this building, we've got people making novel bioplastics, um, mathic, making uh, ethical materials, sort of non, non-leather materials. We've got people using AI to transform and make, make in financial investment more democratic. We've got people making I don't know, custom musical instruments and, 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 uh, and clocks. Uh, we've got people using AI to um, make GPS more accurate by re- removing timing. I mean, you know, yeah. again, I, for I me, know. it's, it's, it's so many people don't realize how diverse all of this is and everything is valid. And it's back to this point, like each person coming in, you know, in, into a community is saying, well, this is my vision of what needs to change in the world. And this is what I'm doing about it. So, so yeah, I, I, it really, I, I can only answer that question in the main about the richness. Yeah. On the one, on the other hand, there are occasion. I'll just give you a, a few examples. Maybe I'll give you a theme which yeah. I've been deeply impressed by, and that is novel material. So, yeah. in this uh, building, we've got Lucy Hughes with Marina Text turning fish waste and red algae into bioplastic. But equally, we've we've had um, 
uh, companies, uh, Biophilica, turning plant waste into vegan leather um, with a multi-million pound valuation. Now we've got potato waste into bioplastics, multi-million pound valuation. You know, um, mycelium fungus into construction materials. You know, I, I, what is so exciting for me is, is, is to see a whole new um, vein of innovation, yeah. especially because I come from a world of physical manufacture originally, oh, sure. where we didn't think about this in the late eighties <laughs> and early nineties. I can tell you, we said, oh, I'll have that plastic. Um, and also I think maybe this is another of my points about diversity. None of the people I've just spoken about are material scientists. The guys who turn potato waste into bioplastic are two guys from from design school, Kingston University, you know, design school, Lucy Hughes design, uh, you know, from Sussex University, we've got loads of people who are practitioners, they are the people who understand how to make materials and they, and, and they become frustrated. And they go, I'm sick and tired and embarrassed, perhaps about being a designer using these materials, I no longer have faith in, let me try to cook up some new materials. So again, this idea that, you know, material scientists are going to create the materials of the future yeah but also no yeah. um so again i think that's the kind of stuff that i find amazing and i'm deeply proud of businesses at any scale some of them are just some of them are, are more kind of turnover based businesses they're selling you know hundreds of thousands or even millions of pounds of of product yeah. via, via, via um you know e-commerce and some of them may be a bit more like a classic startup where they've they've got you know a lot of investment yeah. and they're worth millions in either case, there are times when I've seen almost that idea born yeah, yeah. and I've seen that individual start going, uh, I don't think I'd call myself an entrepreneur, but I'm willing to start. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so to go from that Genesis, uh, you know, it's a bit like seeing my, my kids grow up from being yeah. newborns to, to the teenagers they are now. It's a miraculous journey yeah. seeing not only ideas turned into thriving businesses, but entrepreneur people being turned into more confident business leaders and both of those things I find magical you know because and it really is and that must be just being surrounded by it I guess one of the reasons I probably love coming in as well and speaking to different people about it it's being just inspired by those people is I think you know it just fits so brilliantly and actually with like the the tagline I've come up with actually since I've started I'm nearly up to 50 odd episodes of the podcast now and the tagline for it is everyone has a story to tell and that's what i find fascinating i think no matter who's come on like people i've had people that have come on and sold their businesses for like kevin byrne for sold checker trade for nearly 100 million or whatever yeah. and <laughs> people have come on and they've built businesses for 40 years and then retired and, and gone away and they've come on and told their story so people have just started they're in their first year of running a business and all the the problems that that comes with, but the excitement, and you can tell the excitement. Like Lindsay Clay come on, who's running a company called Connected Brighton, and it was just fascinating to listen. She's, she started it in lockdown, and this sort of grown this little baby of hers, and you can tell the passion she's got, and these huge ambitions to grow it, like yeah. you know, globally, and and just and everyone in between that as well. And just I think is is amazing. Exactly, and 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 on top of that, I think because I think those are such good points. There are also the. the you know, the you and me in this as well, right? Yeah, yeah. It's the infrastructure, you know, what you're doing to create that environment, how we work, you know, together, yeah. or with people like Silicon Brighton or, or yeah, Wide yeah. Sussex or all the rest of it. I mean, that is the other layer, right? And I think um, that's where I think I'm also excited, and because it's not so much the stars on the stage, yeah. but who are the technicians in the background, who are trying to create these platforms. And again, I think that's what's so exciting is that more city leaders than ever before, hopefully more real estate developers, but also others are saying, actually, we need to create these ecosystems. Um, and, uh, and, and, and hopefully, you know, it all stitches together in some, into something wonderful. Yeah, oh, I love it. I love it. Well, look, I, I... Coming towards before we go into our quick fire questions yeah. and sort of finish up, I want to, obviously you, as you sort of mentioned, twenty five in the next five years, there's some big growth plans for Plus X. But talk to me, what what does sort what does the future hold in that regard? Regard and talk to me, what does success look like to you? To you? Yeah, well, I think success for many businesses, um, especially innovative businesses, looks like. Um, more people understanding what you do and going, well, of course, why wouldn't you do stuff? It, at the moment for us, it probably still feels like quite a, a lot of work to persuade um, 
local authorities or deve- or property developers that this is what they should be doing. So I think we're still in this education phase mm-hmm. saying that this is the right thing to do. And I think one aspect of success will be that everyone goes, oh, of course, uh, I believe in what you're doing and I've heard of you. And, and you know, yeah. so so I think we'll, you know, definitely that's what it feels like for us. It, you know, yeah. we, we want to feel like we're doing less spade work. Yeah, um, sure, sure. Um, but clearly, there'll that there'll be a lot of scale. You know, what what we will want is thriving innovation ecosystems in every major city in the UK. Now, might that include international things as well? Yes. But for now, we're sort of saying even even, even just the the UK itself is, is is a challenge. And I think what's going to be amazing about that, I think, is that not only will these communities um, reflect local talent and, and and local capability each will be you know unique but at the same time i think each one will differently contribute to some of the big sort of high level challenges in the world right so how are we going to think about environmental sustainability what might a brighton hub do that's different from a, a manchester hub or an aberdeen hub where they're trying to get beyond oil um, or a Glasgow hub, right? You know, that's hosted COP26. So for me, I'm, I'm going to be fascinated to see uh, not only the scale of the things, but what each one uniquely does, because we're not trying to, try to, try to create, create a sort of a, I don't know, a supermarket here where, where it all feels like it's the same. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, there's a sort of a, a, a method to our, our approach, you know, that there'll, there'll be a certain amount of similarity to what we do everywhere. But each one, of course, will be built from a unique community. And indeed, you know, that will continue to be a challenge for us. How do we go to Glasgow? How do we go to mm-hmm. Birmingham? How do we go to, to um, you know, Manchester? And almost bring our um, qualities and our excitement, but make sure that it is Still collaborative yeah. with, the, with, with, with the local groups. And that's why, again, you know, it's it's, it's another of the things we've loved about being here is the partnerships with the other uh, entities, the networks, the institutions, whatever, because we have to weave together with everyone. Um, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll find ever better ways to do that. You know, that'll be another marker of success, I think. Um, but at the end of it, I just really want to look back and, and say how many lives we've improved, how many innovations are well known you know again it's, it's it's sort of what do the results look like in terms of human stories and kind of innovation and impact stories i think that's going to be pretty amazing what's the what's the what what does the portfolio of output look like as well you know i think that's going like listen to you, you you alluded to it earlier saying like it's great to see these startups come in and then you know they grow and all of a sudden they're multi-million pound valuation businesses and like like you said even like almost must be similar for you i guess like with your children like you say you're seeing them things growing that must be such an exciting space to be as a, as a as a business owner to create that space where you've got that and, and seeing that around you all the time yeah I'm, i must admit you know part, part of my journey is obviously moving from being a consultant yeah. to to doing what i'm doing now and i think this is just even more powerful for me because as a consultant you're kind of doing stuff and occasionally things will launch but here it's more you know some people like it to being a gardener or something you know you're tending a garden and okay some things wither and you, you forget to water some things but overall it's you know, in in, in a, a garden's case, it's sort of you know Mother Nature doing its thing, and you're you're proudly standing back. But frankly, you had a relatively small <laughs> input into this amazing thing, and mostly it was the amazing nature that that took off. I think similarly for me, it sort of it feels like it's very rewarding because obviously it's hard work what we do. All of us work hard yeah, to do what we do, but the return on that that hard work for the whole team, I think, is 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 wonderful when we see as we've said already, the community, the energy, as much as that growth and confidence in people and then the growth in the, in, in the business, uh, the businesses themselves. Brilliant. It gives, I guess, like, ultimately gives us and the people we surround ourselves with purpose. It's, that's what we we strive for, isn't it? As, I yeah. guess as business owners, we go down, I always ask about success because for me, there's still that narrative out there that, that, you know, a successful business, a successful people are based on that financial game where for me, I've changed that narrative a little bit in my head around success that it's not necessarily just about that, but what impact am I having? What purpose for me as an individual? Because because you could set ourselves targets goals wise financially, which most businesses have to do and we do do. 
what happens when you get to that point and you go, okay, I'm going to grow again and you always move in that barrier. Whereas if it's more purpose driven. Yeah. And it starts with why, I mean, and again, don't get me wrong. You know, like I said, one of our organizational values is about having a business mindset. Yeah, yeah. We know we cannot grow unless we are financially successful, but maybe it's also a point about diversity and inclusion again, that actually different people are motivated by different things. And we're trying to say, look, it's a very rich and wonderful mix of things that we're trying to achieve here. And, and, and hopefully everyone gets something out of it. Yeah. But, but I think there's no doubt that, especially when you're trying to build a really fantastic team, yeah. um, having a lack of purpose beyond money, I think is probably problematic these yeah. days in terms of trying to attract and retain the best people. And, and, and I would, uh, I've definitely heard that more and more yeah. um, that people recognize that it's a, it, it, it's a little um, limiting yeah. just to say, I'm going to be rich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, what a brilliant way to start our, our first episode of the 24. And we're, we're going to, I'm going to, I've finished every, I'm going to finish all 24 with these quick fire questions that I similar do with my one all podcast. So um, first one, what one piece of advice would you give to your 18 year old self? Um, so I have no advice for my 18 year old self. <laughs> I was so well supported by my family who guided me actually to go to art school, which was quite a shift. However, I would like to give my 38 year old <laughs> advice, uh, self some advice because that was much harder in terms of stress at work and young family and all the rest of it. And I don't know, uh, get some counseling, get, get some, get some external support, maybe quite seriously, actually yeah, yeah, sure, get more sure. external support. I felt I probably had to kind of really, my wife and I, you know, grit our teeth to get through that's that classic midlife stretch yeah. between, you know, with, with, between you know, kids and work. Right. Yeah, yeah, sure. uh, and I think maybe, uh, eat my own dog food, seek support, seek you know? Support. Yeah. Who, who has been your biggest inspiration throughout your life and why? Um, I think I would have to say again, everyone who, who, who inspires me. I cannot, I was thinking about this the other day. I have no heroes because every Lord, but yet yeah, everyone is brilliant. And I suppose I hold myself to that as well. Of course I'm flawed, right? So I, I, I don't take myself too seriously either. So for me, again, I, I, I try to seek out new people and understand them because I'm inspired by it. Well, almost everyone let's face it sometimes people are a drain not a fountain yeah, of course, but of but in the main i try to be inspired by everyone but but by the bit that they're doing i think i'm i'm inspired by behaviors yeah. as a per, as a whole person no one is perfect yeah. so i think that's how so i'm looking oh you're doing that you know what you're doing here i'm thinking right how could i learn from this right yeah, yeah, yeah. just as much as anything else so i i learn from everyone's behaviors that i admire i think that's it could you recommend a book or podcast for our listeners that has had an impact on you? Yes. Um, so I, I'm going to cite Exponential View by Azim Azar. It's a podcast and he's just written a book called Exponential. Uh, it's got a slightly different name in the US, so hopefully that's the right one. But anyway, Azim Azar. He's he's roughly the same age as me, interestingly. He's been through the same sort of um, journey and was a journalist for a while. The reason why I like him is he comes from a tech background but he puts it in a political and economic context in other words he does sort of what i'm always trying to talk about is mm -hmm. how do we see this in a wider context so exponential view is all about these technologies ai robotics all the rest of it mm -hmm. these things that are growing at this sort of doubling 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 rate this this crazy uh, rate that it's almost hard to to comprehend but he brings in economists and military experts and politicians and others mm -hmm. to to show how this reality of technology in the 21st century is going to have these societal and these economic impacts. Um, so I find it very good for sort of stretching my brain. Yeah. Love that. And finally, what is your one rule for living a fulfilled life? Do what excites you. Um, I've, the, oh, actually, because it's almost like the advice to my 38 year old sense is, is change your job. Uh, part of it was I was sort of come to the end of my time at IDEO and I, w I needed to move on. Yeah. So I, I've always been fired up by what fires me up. And if I'm not fired up, I've got to change it. And so I think that's that general sense of do what you love uh, and work hard at it and be nice to people. You know, that's that's the core of it, right? Mate, 
what a great way to finish. Um, listen, brilliant way to start. I, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your support with obviously with this challenge, but as a whole from working with Plus X and creating this amazing space that I, I spend most of my time in, which I absolutely love. So, um, and thank you for your support with this. It's going to be a great day, I'm sure. And, uh, well, it's been brilliant. Thank you to you um, because, as I say, we do a small amount of stuff and it's it, it, like a, an amazing garden. It, it flowers and it blooms into something amazing, and, and you're fantastic in doing this. And uh, just let us know if we can bring you drinks and snacks. We're all good. We're going to get there. And that they say is a wrap for number one. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs>